Psalm 133, though I think does give us an opportunity to think about Scripture together. This is a song, a melody of David, and it says, Behold, what a good thing, and how pleasurable it is when kindred sit together. Now, one of the things, this is one of those feel-good passages. It talks about good, and it talks about pleasurable. But part of what we heard today from Dr. Hayes and Dr. Hopkins is a verb that often gets shortchanged in that. I think the NRSV turns that into dwell. This is the, the Hebrew word yeshav, which means to sit, to dwell, to rule. Now, sometimes it's, you know, it's easier for us to sit together as long as we don't have to rule together. Okay? Now, part of what happens at the Sankofa Institute is you got to pay attention not only to the together, but to the rule, the sit. You know, unity is a lot like freedom. If you want it, you better fight for it, because it ain't going to just accidentally happen to you. You got to have a strategy. You got to be able to press the strategy. And what we at the Sankofa Institute think is that the Bible helps us with that strategy. Now, a long time ago, I wrote a book, Experience and Tradition. Uh, you can still, on Amazon, you can still order a copy. And I still got children that need money, so <laughs> feel free. You know, you don't have to read it, just buy it. In that, in that book, I have a chapter on Exodus. And this past year at the meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature, a person came up to me and said, what would you do differently in that chapter now these years later? And I had no idea what I was going to say to him. But I did know that I was going to share that with y'all. And so this is my letter to John. Dear John, it was good running into you at the Society of Biblical Liter Literature meeting in Atlanta. And I was struck by your question of how I would write differently that chapter on patriotism and loyalty in experience and tradition. And I have about eight things that I would do differently. Nope, nine. First, I would be more explicit about my understanding of scripture. When I wrote that, I wanted to sell many copies, and I thought clarity might not help me sell as many copies. <laughs> but I, I would be more clear. I think that the true author of Scripture is God. Now, you might ask me, doesn't that put you in a fundamentalist camp and and my reaction is, let me tell you what it helps me get out of. When I was in college and in seminary and in graduate school, I was told that the Bible was written by men and that our goal was to figure out what those men were thinking. And if we figured out what those men would be thinking, that would lead us to good theology. Well, this reminds me of a story that a friend of mine, Randy Bailey, tells. Right. Now, Randy and I are old enough 
that we went to Emory before Emory liked black people. Okay? You know? Some of y'all go to school, and by the time y'all get there, they, they are used to black people, and they like black people. But there was a season, there was a season when they said, we may have let you in, but we don't have to let you out. And someone talked to Randy about his dissertation advisor. And Randy, who, who is a, a remarkable wit and humorous, said of his dissertation advisor, he meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, he took it back to Genesis chapter 50. And when we look at scripture, we have to remember that some of the authors of scripture meant it for evil, yeah. Yeah. but God meant it for good. Yeah. When we talk about Genesis 9, that author meant that for evil. He meant that to justify stealing land from the Canaanites. Now, there, there, there's, no, there's no positive face about the authorial intention. And it's no accident when they wanted proof text for African slavery, they went back to Genesis 10. They, they read the Bible. So, I mean, you'll get folks who say, oh, no, this is a mystery. They understood it was about stealing land. And they wanted to steal people and land. One of the things that Sankofa you're going to figure out, that you can't have an understanding of authorial intention as the only avenue to divine inspiration. So you gotta give that, give that up. Now, number two is in the unity chapter, the one on Genesis, and the patriotism and loyalty chapter, the one on Exodus, I would accent the relationship between those two, not just in the chapters, but the way in which Genesis and Exodus are two foundational stories, each having their own literary life, but who come together in a way that gives us multiple models, or at least two models, to think about our life together. You see, in the book of Genesis, they are much more into endogamy. Now, as people in the Sankofa Institute, y'all know we, we, do, we do those long words that only 15 people know. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm going to sprinkle some of those in here just to let you know I did go to school. You see, in Genesis, there is an emphasis on you got to marry the right person, and they got to be from the right group, and that right group is our group. Okay? So there's always, who are we going to put this young man with, who is our people? Now, I don't want to be hating on the our people in dogmy model of Genesis. Because sometimes that's the difference between a group surviving and not surviving. But if I were to rewrite, I would also remind the readers that in Exodus, you have the exogamous, this is marriage outside the system, of Moses to Zipporah. Now, Zipporah, I, I shouldn't do this, but sometimes the text just gets away. Zipporah. Yeah. You remember in Exodus chapter 4? You know, Moses is feeling good because he, he's had a religious experience. He's been called. He's feeling good. He's on his way to the mission field. 
and the angel of death comes upon him, seeking to kill him. I tell my students, just because you've been called to ministry doesn't mean that God's going to make it easy for you. I mean, sometimes God's going to send a messenger of death. And his exogamous wife knew what to do. She pulled out that flint knife, circumcised her son, and touched her husband's feet. Now, y'all know enough Bible to know the feet ain't feet. So this exogamous wife brought some wisdom to the table. So I would talk about that a little bit more because part of what's going on in our community is not only exogamous relationships, but something that we might want to talk about as hybridity putting together combinations of stuff that didn't used to go together. And part of our thinking together about our life together in Christ, I mean, part of what I, I, I loved about what we've heard so much this, this morning was how much Jesus there was in it. But you can do hybridity if you got Jesus. But without the Jesus, hybridity just becomes putting together a little Asian fusion with a little Spanish, with a little Italian, and you can come up with a culinary mess. So part of what we need to do is think through issues of hybridity. There's an interesting book by Brian Bantam, Redeeming Mulatto, A Theology of Race and Christian Hybridity. But when we think of hybridity, we also have to think of something that we talked about more in the 50s that we don't talk about much anymore, passing. Marsha Allison Dawkins, Clearly Invisible, Racial Passing and the Color of Cultural Identity. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to talk about these things. The third thing I... The third or fourth, I was a religion major, so I, I can sometimes get my numbers confused. I paid too little attention to the situation of African immigrants. I've been in seminary education for a long time, and we have been so, and a good bit of that in, in white schools. And so I've been so protective of my African American students that sometimes I've not paid enough attention to the African immigrant who doesn't really get connected to the African American community and can't get connected to the Anglo community. We, we've got to pay more attention to that global encounter we have. And so Africans are part of the conversation. It's not accidental that uh, the volume, uh, Dr. Kirk Dugan and Hugh Page did on the Africana Bible, is trying to be Africana and trying to pay attention to that. But we just we're just taking baby steps. We need to take better international steps in that regard. Next, I, I would want to remind us that in Exodus, the Hebrew children are embedded with the Egyptians. In those first couple of plagues, the plagues hit the Egyptians. But in the last couple of plagues, everybody gets hurt. You see, the function of the plague stories and the, the language is, is quite explicit so that they might know that I am the Lord. Yeah. So that the Egyptians can get a good theological education. Yeah. But the thing to remember is that the embedded Hebrews also paid a high tuition for their theological education. When we think about reading the Bible 
as black people, we have to remember we're still reading the Bible in a very franchised America. And so when God comes to judge, well, I shouldn't say when as though it's sometime in the future. As God comes to judge consumerism, the fact that we are less consumer than other folks is not going to be an excuse. So the embeddedness of the Hebrews is something I'd lift up more. Next, one of my former, my former pastor once said, what do you do when Pharaoh looks like you? You know, the presence of Ben Carson, Barack Obama, and Charles Thomas complicates the issue of patriotism and loyalty. When I wrote that, I wrote that with none of those folks in mind. Because there was a time we could talk as though we were not sitting at the table. But now there are enough of us sitting at the table that we cannot claim a certain innocence that we could before. And one of the places where this gets remarkably complicated is let's just talk about let's just talk about mass incarceration. I think I talked about mass incarceration last year. And and I look forward to the year I don't talk about mass incarceration. Cuz I look forward to the year it doesn't exist. But when you get mass incarceration, you're going to get folks who say, "What do you mean mass incarceration is racially specific. We elected one of your people to be president. We're clearly in a, look at the Oscars. We must be in a post-racial world. So one of the things that we'd have to take in the serious consideration, we are at the table, but we're only sort of at the table. And so as you unpack scripture, you have to pay attention to both realities. It's easier to write about these texts from a sort of feigned innocence. Next, we have the phenomenon of biblical studies has really changed in the last 25 years. 25 years ago, especially among Protestants, especially among Baptists, there was the assumption that there was the Bible and then there was me. And I didn't need to attend to anything between the Bible and me because all those interpreters, you know, mainline Protestants said all those interpreters before the Enlightenment, they didn't know my method and so we, don't, we ignore them. And in our churches, we often said, all those interpreters who were white, we don't have to pay attention to them. And so lo and behold, it was just me and the Bible. But those days are dead. Those days are dead. If you were hoping for those days, they ain't coming back. If you come to Sankofa, you're going to have to pay attention to how people have read the Bible through the years. Now, just two books, just two books I want to mention here. And I don't get royalties on e either of these two books. Uh, one was by Herbert Marbury. The Pillar of Cloud and the Pillar of Fire. You see, one of the things that is fascinating, a few years ago, we discovered that black people have been interpreting the Bible since the beginning of the Bible. And there has been a move to go back and reclaim that. Uh, a conference sponsored by Vincent Wimbush, African Americans and the Bible. The conversation before that had been African Americans in the Bible. But with this conference, things shifted. And so we started paying attention to that sort of shift. And what we get with Marbury is an appreciation of how we have 
read Exodus in the past, he creates a, a typology. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Here he's using images from Exodus itself. The pillar of cloud he uses to describe the masking. You remember the masking model from the Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem, I Wear the Mask, which conceals and advertises sort of simultaneously. You see, the pillar of cloud is about fitting in in order to change stuff. Now, he also says in the history of Exodus, exegesis, you will get folks who will be the pillars of fire. And as you might imagine, this is a lot hotter than cloud. And in the pillar of fire, you lift up your out of placeness as a way to challenge the status quo. And he goes through different periods of time, and so he's going to lift up Absalom Jones of Philadelphia. But he's also going to remind us of David Walker, the pillar of fire. He's going to talk about Francis E.W. Harper as a pillar of cloud. And John Jasper as a pillar of fire. Now, I have to say, as a Baptist, John Jasper doesn't show up much in uh, Baptist identity classes. That's why you need to be at the Sankofa Institute because there are a lot of places where a lot of these folks aren't in your church history. Interestingly enough, he's going to talk about Martin Luther King as a pillar of cloud. Respectability politics. And he's going to talk about Adam Clayton Powell is really not. And Cleege as not. It's interesting that Mar and Marbury just dwells on this just a moment and a half. That at least two of his pillars of fire were the lightest skinned folks in the book you got to pay attention to the history of interpretation. But one of the things that, an, another book that, that I, I recently read was Nyasha Jr.'s Womanist Biblical Interpretation. This book challenged me. <laughs> but the part I liked the most. <laughs> But the part I liked the most. One of the things she does so beautifully is she makes the point that womanist interpretation did not begin with Alice Walker. She reminds us of Sojourner Truth. She reminds us of the Female Literary Association of Philadelphia in 1831. She reminds us of the National Association of Colored Women with Ida Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell, 1896. She reminds us of a book by Elizabeth, a colored minister of the gospel born in slavery. This was one of my favorites, partly because I've been to so many churches where they say, Women clergy are a newfangled thing. And so I'm inclined to give them this book from 1863. <laughs> she also reminds us of the work of Maria W. Stewart, Mrs. Jarena Lee, Anna Julia Cooper. And she then says, if you look at this, we get a movement with Renita Weems, Cheryl Kirk Dugan, Clarice Martin, Diana Hayes. And so when we talk about womanist, it is already built in to the resisting reading 
that you've had from African American women for centuries. I'd pay more attention to that. Another thing that I would look at is how the terrain of African American religiosity has shifted in the years since experience and tradition. I remember being around the table of the folks who ended up writing Stony the Road We Tried. A couple things you were, were pretty obvious. One, it was a bunch of guys yeah. with only two women. And two, the assumption of black Christendom. There was just a sense that black biblical studies would always be an extension of the black church. Now this was before many of those folks realized that the black church was also Catholic as well as Protestant. You see, the terrain of black religiosity and Christianity is a lot broader than it used to be. For the first time, we now have religious studies strategies of training clergy. For the first time, we have nuns. Y'all, y'all, nuns, y do y'all use that category here at Sankofa? People can choose their religious affiliation, and for the nuns, what they, what they mark as their religious affiliation is none. And you now have black nuns, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E. None of the above. This is a different black world than I grew up in. But it is the world that y'all will minister in. You cannot take for granted when you encounter a black person that they have a church home or that they even, that they even have that on their radar that they ought to have a church home. That means you're going to read the Bible in a different way. You're going to have to read it in a way that engages both the believing community but can be understood by folks who aren't in that community. This gets even more complicated because we've talked about the black community and we've talked about the reification of parts of the black community. Recently at our seminary we had uh, a pastor of a prominent uh, Little Rock black church and he said one of the challenges of his of his congregation is he now has folks so far removed from poverty that they don't resonate when you start to tell the story of the black church. They don't know poor people, white or black. And so, and so when you start talking about, you know, I'm glad to be here, I'm glad I'm not on that cooling, on that cooling board. You know, for years and years, that was one of the opening lines. If, if you are three generations separated from want, that doesn't make any sense at all. And so one of his challenges is, how do you reach that generation of black people and not lose the rich heritage that we have? And so I'd, I'd somehow want to pay attention to that. Finally, one of the reasons I think it's important that you come to the Sankofa Institute is you're going to have to think about the future of the black church. I think you'd be stunned and embarrassed by how many black churches spend no time thinking about the future of the black church. 
we are an affinity group. We've been an affinity group, and we just assume we're going to keep being an affinity group. We don't live in the parish anymore. We, we're commuting in. Uh, and, and then, why are we commuting in? One of the things that's going to be important in your time at the Sankofa Institute is you've got to make a cogent case for the black church. There was a, a study done by Pew Research that found that folks who went to, black folks who went to white churches tend to think like the white people in that church. And black folks who don't go to white churches, they don't. Huh, figure that. You know, I'm all, I'm all for unity and the like, but the black church serves a particular function in the life of the broader Catholic church. But we've got to be articulate about that. We, we cannot just sort of take that as a social demographic that will on, keep going on. And at Sankofa, you have a space to think about that. I've, as I said, I've taught in, in uh, mostly white seminaries, and they've tried to be open-minded about the black church, but they have no idea why it exists. They say in a post-racial age, why y'all keep meeting together? Did y'all not get the email? And so you need to be able to have a cogent response when folks say, in a post-racial world, there's no place for the black church. I think if you spend time at the Sankofa Institute, you will, in fact, have a cogent response to that. Dr. Hayes put it eloquently. We are still here. They have tried to kill us. They've tried to bankrupt us. But we are still here. But we need to tell folks why we're still here. Now, I begin with uh, Psalm 133, that uh, unity is good and pleasant. Uh, but before it's good and pleasant, you gotta, you got to do the exercise. Uh, you got to do the work. Uh, Sister Addie Walker is going to work you. As quiet as it's kept, she's going to work you hard. And it, if you're allergic to work, there's a program on Up 35 you can participate in. Okay? But here at Sankofa, no work, no unity. Okay? And so my, my, my final word to you, are you ready to join the fight for unity?